Happy Saturday, happy 2023, episode 94. Wow, 94 episodes, 94 weeks in a row, not missing one. Talk about a maniacal drive, relentless, consistent, persistent. Uh, my goodness, we have a special treat today. I can't wait to bring him on. Uh, we're gonna bring on James in less than five. In the meantime, waiting for Big Dave, my partner in crime, the articulate alligator, the sex mongoose. <laughs> Did I lose my mind, Dave? Maybe. Let's bring you on right now, you stud. Drop a win in the chat for 2023 so far. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh my goodness. What's going on, my friend? All is great. Happy 2023. One of my favorite parts of the week. Uh, is doing this with you 94 weeks in a row it's great to see you i'm doing How great you, man i'm blessed i just got back from ces and uh it's interesting um we had uh, 16 foot waves down in san diego and all the beach houses on the boardwalk got flooded uh you know it was amazing and while i was at ces you know my family had to start taking care of the mess that's created by that much water and you know, everybody was around me was so concerned and, and all I felt was blessed uh, that nobody was hurt, uh, that you know, I could afford any damage that was made, you know, and, and I kind of utilized this New Year's as a quantitative analysis of how long did I stay at Dissy's over an unfortunate incident and what was it there to learn from it? And instead of being punished or you know, and a lot of people obviously have a lot of friends that own those homes on the boardwalk there in South Mission. They took that victim perspective. And, you know, I'm reaching a level where I can have these uh, incidences, events in our lives that uh, can have a different meaning than the one that most people give to it, uh, a positive meaning. And, you know, it is just the way that we see it. And this was a great opportunity for me to exercise a good mindset, a good heart set, offering to help everyone else uh, around me that wasn't taking that mindset. And then, of course, just pragmatically doing the right things with the right behavior so that even economically I'm in the right position uh, that something like this could happen. So I was prepared with the appropriate savings and insurance and things like that instead of blaming everyone else you know, oh, now I can't do this. It's it's really not a big deal. In fact, there's even more lessons to continually uh, look at the behaviors that are going to aggregate so that when uh, unexpected events happen, uh, that you actually are in a better place, a better position. You're being promoted and protected. And a lot of people may think that's bullshit, but I try my best to explain that if you do these things, you will be in that position where what other people see as tragedy, you can actually benefit from, not the other people's tragedy, but your own circumstance. This is awesome. And first of all, I just want to say you really <laughs> are a brilliant Billy Goat. But in regards to that, <laughs> but Dave, all kidding aside, you asked me maybe a week or two ago, what was one of the biggest lessons that you ever taught me? And I think that might be the one. Just understand that everything that seems like adversity at the time, if I choose a different thought, such as this is protecting and propelling me to the greater, although I might not be able to identify it right now, I know that it is. Even something like getting hit by a car will not paralyze me because I feel like there's a meaning for it and it's leading me to something greater. And everybody has the choice if they want to dwell in that or choose that they're actually being yeah, so I got two things to say to that. Let, you, you got hit by a car. And what if, because you got hit by a car, and you, you now look at it the way that I taught you to look at it, as being propelled and promoted, you're getting married, you have kids, you then tell the story, because you live in New York City, you tell the story to your children about how you weren't really looking and or or you did look or whatever happened but the lesson right that your dad almost died because a car hit him and if it was one or two inches farther you you may have been either seriously injured or dead 
because of the speed at which the car was going, that leaves the seed in those children. And that little incident may have saved your children's lives or your grandchildren's lives because they passed that story on. And although it seems like you were a victim, it was a way in which you learn with a significant story to teach your children instead of saying, hey, you know what? You should look both ways. It means a lot more when your dad emotionally tells a story how they almost were killed because of whatever the circumstance was to teach the lesson of looking both ways when you live in the city and so i see things without time linear time into generations or even lifetimes that you know I, great saying right if you ain't making mistakes craig then god's made the mistake you shouldn't be here right if you're not making the mistakes god made the mistakes now I will put this into a business format. I have a new interview uh, process. You, you ready for this one? And it, it applies to this story. So I'm going to take all the people that are interviewing that I think are right there at the final interview stage, and I'm going to find the scariest roller coaster, right? Because that's the way business is. It's, you know, up and down, up and down, and the loop and the loop and the loop. And when they come off, when they puke, if they puke and say to me, oh, my God, that was great. I want to do it again. I'm going to hire them because that's the attitude that you have to have right in life. It's ups and downs and loops and loops. And then, you know, you puke and, you're, and, it's, and some people are like, I'm never doing that again. And other people are like, that was great. Right. They, they survived the whole roller coaster. And then their attitude is, man, that was great. I, and then on top of it, I want to do it again. That's the guy I want to hire. Or girl, or girl, sorry. I have to unlearn a few things. I'm an old man. I mean girls and guys, of course. Of course. I just got like a dopamine hit because I was so engaged with what you were saying and it just really resonated with me and I just love it and I love you. I know our guest James is on here. We're gonna bring you on two minutes, James. I'm really excited. Uh, let's try something new. Just keep everything excited. Whoever leaves the best takeaway from this conversation drops it in the chat after we post it. Uh, me and Dave are going to send you something special. And we'll continue to do it every yeah, single week. Yeah, do me a favor. Why don't you bring in our, our guest, Dave? Then, when... then DM Craig, and D, not in the notes, DM Craig, DM me. DM us both the takeaway. Then we'll vote, Craig, and we'll take them all. We'll vote, and we'll each send them something. Done. Love it. Um, love that very much. Great idea. Okay, before we bring on James, I wanted to ask you about this, something I dealt with this week, and, and you've been talking about this in your content this week, which I study like, like a hair, whole hair, hair, everybody oh. should. How to handle... By the way, I, I was going to uh, button up another button. And yeah, that's cool. Just like uh, this for you. Uh, Jay Shetty said today, the best way that you can love someone is to encourage them to be themselves. So rip the shirt off if you need to, Ray. <laughs> Dave, how do you handle Yeah, so frustration, frustration is an ego-based consciousness. It's the same as the need to be right, offended, separate, inferior, superior, anxious, frustrated, guilty, resentful. Uh, all of those feelings are ego-based consciousness. So I have a mechanism, one, to practice identify when I feel frustrated. Most people don't utilize the first step of practicing identifying these things. See, because what happens is if we don't use our conscious to identify the ego-based conscious, then we'll never be able to have a solution or a method methodology towards being our better selves from being frustrated. So how can we do it? So one, identify it and practice identifying it. Two, instead of resisting it, fighting it, out lodging it, reasoning it, telling ourselves, let it go, let it go. That used to be my mechanism or modality. If I recognized it, because I wasn't practicing, if I recognized the frustration, I would say, let it go. Not a big deal. Don't be so frustrated. Let it go. Instead, now, I don't do any of that. I don't go over and under it, through it, around it. I don't deny it. I don't lie to it, cheat it, manipulate it, or resist it. I simply stop. I breathe through my nose, out through my mouth, and then I have a process called remind, remember, and recollect. I remind to the great source. I remember with the great source. I recollect from the great source of omniscient, all-powerful, and all-knowing. And I threw that role into what I want, who I can help, who can help me, how to get it done. Prioritizing, again, 
what I want to do today and the trajectory of what I think I want in the future, applying my why, not in search of it, and not allowing the frustration to interfere with it. I remind, remember, and recollect, I am happy, healthy, wealthy, worthy. I'm not going to let this frustration interfere with it. Could you be getting more on fire today? I mean, the only question I have is how many sexy well, salami I, sandwiches I had a big workout, so I'm on th no, sexy salami number three. Oof, I love it. I'm going to bring on James right now, and we're going to get this party rolling. Congratulations yeah, New York, to Los Angeles New Giants as well. So it's going to be an amazing opportunity. And I'm glad to see our Buffalo Bill Darius is doing well, up and talking and breathing. Oh, my goodness. Hey, Look at this guy. How you guys doing? Good to see you. What's up, Dean? Good. Thank you for joining Good. us. Good to see you, Craig. Good How to are see you, you, David? I haven't seen you in about a month or so. Yeah, we'll have you back on, man. And uh, this is the three Jew crew, so I like it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, James, Atlanta, where did you get all in from? Could, yeah, they kicked him out of New York because he's too smart. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm literally exiled from New York City. <laughs> I love it. We'll, we'll get rocking today. For the audience that might not be familiar with James, do yourself a favor. Do a deep dive. Check out his content. Read his books. What I think is going to hit home the, the most today is we just have an unbelievable conversation. I'm going to get right into it. Uh, one of your books, Choose Yourself, it is an instant classic. It's epic. I love those two words together. For the audience, I think they could use this today. What does that mean? You know, it's funny. That book yourself? is now about to have its 10th year anniversary. And I'm really gratified. Like, people send me emails about it almost every day. I think it's a, a, a sleeper. It, keep, it keeps going. And uh, uh, I've been really proud of it. But basically, it was about, about me. Like, I went, you know, I had sold the company. I had made some money. And then through a variety of bad decisions, I went completely broke, lost my home, lost everything. And I was really depressed, even suicidal, and I had to build back up. And by the way, as, as you guys know, on the way up, everyone's your friend. On the way down, no one will even hold out a hand to, to save you from going down further. And, and that's just a truth. And so you ha no one was choosing me. No one, I couldn't get any opportunity. And I had to figure out bit by bit, okay, if I want to publish a book, here's how to publish a book. If I want to um, write articles for somebody, I have to do it. No one's going to choose me. If I wanted to uh, have a job, no one was going to give me a job. I had to create my own jobs and find sources of income that, you know, everybody thought basically I was a failure. So, and this happened to me more than once where I had to kind of restart. And choosing yourself means whatever your passion is, whatever your interest it is, whatever your love is, you don't have to wait for someone else to choose you to do it. You can be a success at what you love, but you have to create the environment by which you're going to be successful. Yeah. He's my boy, and every time I see him, listen to him, read his books, or have him in person, uh, I know that my frequency is my neighborhood, and this guy's in my neighborhood. I'm going to add to what James said, uh, because we share, obviously, similar experience of losing everything, and uh, I have a, a new way of explaining some of that experience is, you know, where I am today, let's say I'm at base camp five today. What I have found is that everyone at base camp six and seven is I'm climbing my mountain of potential. Like James, he's, he's there always. Dave, whatever I can do for you, whatever I can do for you, you can do it, Dave. Trust me, just keep it, you know, he, you can get to base camp six, Dave. But it's really funny when I started realizing the only people telling me I can't get to base camp six are all the MFers that are at base camp four, three, two, and one. All they're telling me all the time is you can't do it. You can't do it. it they're laughing at me, scoffing at me, making fun of me. And as I fell down from base camp five to three to two to one, all they were doing is continually like just laughing at me. I told you so. I told you so. I told you so. I mean, I, I have to add to what David said. I have a rule now. If someone tells me, like if I say, oh, I would like to do X, Y, or Z. If someone says, you can't do that, that means I have to now do it. <laughs> I have to at least try to do it. Nice. Well, so, hey, James, you cannot change the world. Yeah, well, <laughs> the question is, 
wanting to change the world, but that's another story. But <laughs> I don't try to do itself. that. It'll change by itself. So let's just make it. Let's make it better with our own. Uh, no, but our you, own skills. No, I've been thinking about this. Like everyone says, uh, uh, okay, you know, you have to do this. You have to uh, vote for this, or believe in this, or have this opinion. Or silence is violence is like the new phrase my my kids are telling me. And my feeling is, if I just mm -hmm. hang out with people I love and and enjoy, and not argue about dumb political things that are not going to matter you know, a year from now, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna change the world for the better. But arguing is, is gonna change the world for the worse because two people arguing on Twitter are certainly not gonna change things. And it's gonna reduce the quality of life of everybody who's paying attention and certainly your own quality of life, which affects the people around you. Yeah, I love that. Dave, that's something you always talk about. Like when you, if you're at dinner and someone disagrees upon religion or politics, why can't we just all yeah, be on the same page? Or there's powerful way, right? words. And one of them that I use is, I appreciate that. that I mean, imagine if someone shares their opinion because you don't want to silence other people as well. And whether you agree with what they say or not, you should appreciate what people do say, think, believe, and feel. All it means is I'd like to add value to it by appreciating it, meaning maybe I am thinking about it and it's so adverse to what I think that I appreciate it because it's telling me what not to do, right? This is part of parenting. I had a, a dad, people say, well, who'd you learn the most from in your life? And sometimes I tell people, I think it's my father. Oh, what advice did he give you? I'm like, he didn't. He just showed me what not to do as a father. I appreciate my dad because I learned some great lessons of how to be a shitty dad and I didn't want to be a shitty dad. So I take his example and I do the opposite, but I always told my dad, I appreciated him and he made me a better dad. He we did use the methodology that I'd like to use to make my son a better dad, but we can appreciate everyone. We can add value to everyone. And sometimes I think James being quiet is adding value. Silence is not violence. And right. I, I don't always, I appreciate my kids and yours for saying shit like that but I don't have to agree with it. <laughs> no, it, it, it It's true. And like, they, parenting is a great kind of laboratory for, for understanding persuasion and, and advice and persuade and, and influence because kids do not listen to your words. Your words is like another language for them. They don't even understand what you're saying and they, or they just choose not to listen. But they do watch you and and that is what they grow up with is watching your behavior and that's what they'll replicate so uh, you know if my, my kids say one plus one equals five i'm like yeah you might be right I, I don't know but if then i go around living one plus one equals two eventually that's the way they'll live as well i love that yeah 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 same uh, this coming, there's so many places we could take this conversation. I know it's Saturday. I want to be conscious of everybody's time. James, one of the really cool dynamic things that you do is you love to write and, and you write blogs. And, and I was checking out one myself and, and I thought it was pretty cool. You were talking about how to be successful. You talked about persistence and discipline. But I wanted to ask you, I think this might hit home for the audience. How can one go about improving the psychology behind You know, success? it's a real interesting question because success is hand in hand with rejection, failure, disappointment along the way. And you really have to get good at all, at dealing with rejection, dealing with a disappointment, becoming anti-fragile as Nassim Taleb would put it, and, and bouncing back stronger. And that's really hard. Like it was impossible for me when I was younger and I, and I, and I had to get good at it. But I think the psychology of success is very much linked to optimism. And, op and not like stupid optimism, like, you know, if our ancestors, if they were in an ice age, they would dress warm, they weren't stupid. The ones who survived were realistic. But you, but, but you have to, you have to oh, in order to try new things, you have to be somewhat optimistic that they're going to work. So even if you've like failed at everything and no one seems to want you, you can't go global with that. You can't be like, well, I guess for the rest of my life, I'm never, nothing good is ever going to happen to me. You have to say, okay, you know what? What did I do wrong? What can I be curious about to be better? What can I, tr what can I experiment with? Uh, uh, you have to be optimistic that what you try will work. And then you learn through experience how to take the risk out of situations. And, and then your optimism 
comes true. If you're pessimistic, you're just never going to try. And so cultivating optimism. And so how do you cultivate more optimism? Because I'm not generally a naturally optimistic person. The way you cultivate it is, okay, here are the 10 catastrophes that are about to happen to me. Well, is, is that really true? Let's just play a, a thought experiment. What are the 10 best things that could happen to me? Okay, now somewhere between the worst and the best is the reality, because that's from experience. You know that not every worst case scenario comes true. And so, so the reality is, okay, this is probably going to happen. How can I remove the risk from it? What can I experiment with? I have this theory, you know, you know the 10,000 hour rule where uh, it say, it, they say if you do 10,000 hours or something, you're gonna be the best in the world at it. My feeling is don't be the best in the world at something. Be in the top 1%, which is fine. If 600 million people play, play tennis, you don't need to be in the top 10. You could be in the top 6 million and you're in the top 1% of that. So try experiments, experiment with, like with writing. Oh, okay, you wanna write a blog post? Just do an experiment. Write it in the second person instead of the first person. Write it in the form of letters to your back and forth to your child. Write it in the form of a Kickstarter campaign. Like there's all these things you can do to experiment. And oh, you have a business? Oh, let's try just selling to people over the age of 90. Let's try marketing to, uh, or let's try making a product that's, you know, again, you experiment with different forms of the product, different customer bases, and through experimentation, that's how you learn where the risks are, how to try new things. You build that possibility muscle of what's possible when you thought it wasn't possible. I remember one time I worked at HBO for a while and I decided I was, I was on the eighth level of the hierarchy like my boss's 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 boss was the ceo so so one day i decide <laughs> i'm gonna go to the ceo and this was in the 90s so it was like the beginning of the web and i'm on the way there and i run into somebody and i say i'm going to the ceo's office and she says you can't just go to the ceo's office so of course i had to go so i go to the ceo's, CEO's office and, and i just walk past the secretary i go into the office i, I wouldn't do that now it's too I was too young. <laughs> this is what young people do. And he's like, who are you? And how did you get past the secretary? And I said, listen, just like HBO has original TV shows on TV, let's do original web shows on this new media in the web. And he's like, I don't even know what that is. Do whatever you want. So now I go back to my boss and he's like, you went to the CEO without me? And I'm like, yeah, but he told me I had to do this now. So now that became my job. <laughs> was to create original web shows for HBO, which I did for several years. And then that led to building a company, making websites for other people. And, you know, I sold that company and then, and then I went broke. But that's, that's another part of the story. <laughs> James so always is quite up today, like right? a passion and purpose and profitability now. And for me, I have the opposite genetics and energetics that James has. I was born a optimist, So, I did see and probably why I lost everything, uh, being responsible, knowing attraction and my participation in a perception. And that participation in a perception is controlled by or driven by our optimism or pessimism. And so I think for me, I utilize daily practices uh, to allow me to control the ego-based consciousness. So uh, the possibilities are created by me knowing what I want today personally, experientially giving and receiving what I want today, not what other people want, not what's missing, not what I don't have, but what do I want today in a trajectory of what I think I want? And then it becomes a probability by asking, okay, who can help me? So if I want to write a blog, because that's aligned with my trajectory of where I want to be, I'm going to go find James and ask him for help, or I'm going to go eight levels up to the CEO and ask him, but I'm also going to know who can I help? Uh, and then I go to the how, right? Which then creates, instead of just a possibility or probability, that's what creates my perspective. When I start uh, reconciling reality into a possibility and a probability and say, shit, now I got to figure out how I'm going to do a web show on HBO. Now it becomes my perception. And when I prioritize it, like James did, and talk to his boss and know that he's going to get spanked for going over him, but yet, what happened? He then prioritized the web and the web shows, which created this inspiration, intellect, and intuition that manifested a coincidence of one, 
making all this money, helping all these people and having fun with his web business and selling it. And then the universe said, okay, Mr. Optimist, here's some more lessons because you got this figured out. And I'm going to go back to my favorite saying of the day. If you aren't making mistakes, then God made the mistake. You shouldn't be here. And so no matter what base camp you reach, there's going to be more mistakes because that's why you're here. And if you're not making mistakes, then God's made a mistake. You shouldn't be here. You guys, I, I, have, I have a question for you too. Like, sometimes I ask myself, why the hell am I doing hard things? <laughs> like, if you're, in, if you're, in, and look, everybody listening to this also, we're all either entrepreneurs or writers or creators or performers, peak performers of some type, or we would like to be. And I always wonder, why not be a bird watcher? Like, bird watchers don't, get disappointed. I don't think they get really disappointed. Like, oh, I didn't see a uh, hyacinth macaw today. I'm a failure. Like, they don't but do they that. Do. They're just like, oh, I was out in nature. I saw some birds. I didn't see the ones I would wanted, but that's okay. I'll go out tomorrow. But like, if you're like an athlete, for instance, or an entrepreneur, if you don't get the client or if you don't win the competition, you're really disappointed. You're upset. If you lose money, if you're an investor and you lose money, you're upset. And I ask myself, why over the past 30 years am I always choosing activities where I'm going to have those highs, but I'm also going to have these incredible lows? And maybe it's better to be a bird watcher or, 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 or cut bonsai trees. Like, I would, love to be, I would love to love trimming bonsai trees, but I just don't. I want to be a chess grandmaster. And then you go to a tournament and you lose every game, and it's like, oh, man, what the heck? The answer for me is something that Dave helped me articulate it, it very well, is that it's not the destination. Happiness is the pursuit, right? Figuring things out, going through the processes, the good, the bad, the ugly, the highs, the lows. That's what I've come to fall yeah, with. Taking Dave, take it further, away. Right? My definition of, of happiness is the enjoyment of the consistent, like Gladwell talks about in the 10,000 repetitions that are necessary, or and the enjoyment of the consistent, persistent without quit, pursuit of my potential. I, I think great joy comes from pursuit of your potential. So whether you're a bird watcher or you're James Olshift or, or Greg Siegel or whoever else in the world, whatever you're pursuing, if you wanna be a bird watcher, and not pursue being the best bird watcher and not pursue seeing the rarest bird in the world, then you're not going to enjoy it. It's that roller coaster analogy, right? I want to live my life with someone that rides the roller coaster and does the circles and the ups and the downs and then pukes and then looks up at me and goes, that was great. Let's do it again. That, I, those are the people that I want. I, I, it drives me nuts. Like, the people that go up into like the Ganja Mountains, and you know, I'm around a lot of you know different thought leaders, quote unquote. And you know, I've met a few that are like, you know, I went out to India for six years and I meditated. I was like, fuck, man, why are you even here? Like, just move on to the next plane. Like, literally, like, why would you be here when we got all these killer roller coasters to ride and we got all these failures to to have, like going to Grandmaster chess tournaments and getting our ass kicked? I mean, you're looking at a short. Jewish guy with very little athletic talent that wanted to play professional football. I ask you, how many of us exist and how many have made the NFL? And it will answer your question. But yet, how many of us tried to do it or thought they could do it in whatever it is? And meanwhile, when I was an average Division three football player, it was one of the greatest joys of my life. And I was at best an average Division three college football player who dreamed of being an NFL star, but found a way to enjoy that journey and still looks back and said, this is a litmus test for, am I going to enjoy whatever else I'm going to get my ass kicked in? Anyway. Although, although David, if the entire NFL was, was Jews, then every game would be like 2-0. <laughs> like someone, would, someone would fumble in the end zone and there would be a safety <laughs> and that's that. Yeah. Although, you know, we, if they were all commissioners, it would be a trillion dollar business instead of a hundred billion dollar business. So all right, uh, don't talk, <laughs> don't, don't talk to Kanye about that. Let's yeah, let's yeah, keep yeah. that part quiet. <laughs> <laughs>
James, how can our audience and community well, support you? Well, you know, it's funny. Guys? Like, I think the things we do, and this really adds to what, what David is saying, is you wake up and, you, and your heart is like a barometer of, of what you want to do that day or what you want to do with your life and how you want to change the world. So just a couple of weeks ago, just on a whim, so many people were asking me about writing and how to write a better blog post or article or, or book or whatever. So uh, we shot about like that weekend, I scripted it out. We shot 20 hours of video. Like taking action is really critical because no matter what your mindset, action overcomes mindset. So that weekend, just we, we shot 20 hours of video, we're editing it down. And I'm, I'm making a writing course right now, something I never expected to do. There's no real reason for me to do it. I don't need to do it, but I wanted to do it and I loved doing it. It was what my heart wanted me to do that weekend. And my wife helped out, my kids helped out, everybody helped out and uh, it was fun. So I'm releasing that in a couple of weeks. I, I think probably on Udemy I'll release it. I don't even know. And I've never done an online course. I have no idea. Thank you. Yeah. Hell yeah. Congratulations on that. I'm yeah, check I do out. more of those. Oh, Dave, look at what I'm saying. The whole community talk about uh, as a person with a lot of business uh, dummy tax, which means I have a lot of situational knowledge. Uh, the future of, of people like us are are the middle class of media, meaning that if we create these courses, uh, there's a huge opportunity. And I think I spoke about it with you last call, Craig. That you know just. If it takes you a weekend to do and you give your intention to it. So James went ahead and he did it. He talked about it. He thought about it. He believed it and he felt it. And so then he took action. And now, you know, I don't know how much his courses are. I'm doing, you know, hey, how to be a sports agent. Why? Because that's my expertise. How to be a sports agent, 27 bucks. And in the first month of 100 people buy the, the course in the next month, 110 and the next month, 120 eventually there'll be a thousand people or more a month buying this one course. And in the meantime, next time I get a feeling for my course or what I'm good at, you know, I might end up with 10 courses making 27 grand a month. Yeah. And that's $270,000 a month. This middle class is wide open. If you know your essence, your expertise and put intention into it. And James is an expert of intention. I think it comes naturally to him. A lot of other people have to force themselves to think, say, do, believe and feel it he goes with the heart that's the highest level of intention and then he puts the pragmatic practices in place and he asks for help from his family from producers or whoever else so i think that's a classic example of how to be passionate purposeful but also profitable which is one of my expertise is hey these are all great ideas but let me show you how to make money from it yeah you know i just want to mention the thing about profitability it is important to be profitable because that, in a weird way, is a good metric for telling you you had a good idea, an idea that people were willing to raise their hand and say, this is so valuable, I'm willing to pay for it. And then, you know, like if you're, if you're like, a, you see this with a lot of like sons of rich, of rich parents, they do things that are fun, but are not really useful or, pro, or, or, or profitable because nobody really wants what they're doing. Like it really kind of shows you you're on the right path. Money is not just, oh, this bad thing. It's money points also the direction that, okay, you're on the right path and you're creating something that is helping people. Because that means people are getting more value out of it than what they're paying for. Great point. Hell yeah. Well, uh, only negative I got going on is we don't have 10 hours to chat. This conversation was awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for both of you. James, I'm excited to connect further and get to know you. And for the audience listening, go check out James. Go see what he's got going on. Check out his course. And Dave, Thank you, guys. You guys. Good to see you, James. So Good to see, see you, Craig. Have a great weekend. Yeah, see you guys later. Right on. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. The Paradigm Shift episode 94 in the books. We'll be back next week for the Paradigm Shift episode 95. In addition, uh, we have a special treat for the Paradigm Shift episode 100. Uh, which we could say now will be featuring Ed Milet. It's going to be featured on a Valentine's Day special. So get your calendars ready. Uh, let's make 2023 the best year ever, guys. We talked about so many valuable lessons on this call from James, from Dave, from myself, all priceless. But it's only potential knowledge, right? It's only potential power. You have to actually have to implement it and lean into it and utilize these tools and strategies. Uh, thank you guys so much by my heart. DM me and Dave 
the best takeaway from this conversation and we will send you the gift specifically customized for you. You dig? Happy Saturday.